From Pacifica, this is Democracy Now! Cette cathédrale, nous la rebâtirons. We will rebuild this cathedral together, and it is undoubtedly part of the French destiny and a project for the years to come. We will rebuild Notre Dame, because that's what the French expect, and because it is what our history deserves, because it's our underlying destiny. France is vowing to rebuild Paris's beloved Notre Dame Cathedral, a day after a fire ripped through the more than 850-year-old church, which has been the center of Catholic life in France for centuries. The fire toppled Notre Dame's iconic spire, but the main structure of the church remains standing. We'll get the latest and look at the historical significance of Notre Dame. Then we speak with Palestinian human rights activist Omar Barghouti, a founder of the Boycott, Divestment and Sanctions movement. He was scheduled to join us in our New York studio today, but he was denied entry to the United States. I think what happened to me yesterday morning at Ben Gurion Airport is just part of an ongoing uh, repression by Israel directly or by proxy by the United States on behalf of Israel uh, to silence human rights defenders in the BDS movement. Israel has been working uh, very hard since 2014 uh, to shut us down, and the movement keeps growing. Omar Barghouti will join us from Ramallah in the West Bank. Then Democratic Congresswoman Ilhan Omar is facing a spike in death threats after the president, the New York Post and others falsely accused her of downplaying the September 11th attacks. We'll speak with Mustafa Bayoumi, author of This Muslim American Life, Dispatches from the War on Terror. All that and more coming up. Welcome to Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman. France is reeling today after a massive fire tore through Paris's beloved Notre Dame Cathedral, a medieval church built close to 900 years ago, a celebrated landmark around the world. Parisians looked on in shock Monday as around 400 firefighters attempted to get the blaze under control, some engaging in prayers and religious songs. The fire claimed the cathedral's spire and ravaged parts of the interior, but the iconic twin medieval towers remain standing, as does the rest of the stone structure. French President Emmanuel Macron vowed to rebuild the cathedral. Well beyond our borders, we will appeal to the greatest talents, and many people will come to contribute to it. And we will rebuild. We will rebuild Notre Dame, because that's what the French expect, and because it is what our history deserves, because it's our underlying destiny. Two of France's wealthiest men have already pledged over $330 million to the reconstruction effort. The European Union has also vowed to help rebuild the cathedral. Authorities have launched an investigation into how the the fire started, but ruled out arson, saying they believe it was started by accident, likely related to the ongoing $180 million renovation of the church. We'll have more on the story after headlines with Johns Hopkins professor Ann Lester. In Jerusalem, another fire at a major holy site broke out Monday. The blaze at Al-Aqsa Mosque broke out in the Marwani prayer room. But Palestinian authorities say the blaze was contained. They're now assessing the damage. Al-Aqsa is located in the old city of occupied East Jerusalem. House Democrats issued subpoenas in Deutsche Bank and other banks Monday as part of the several congressional probes into the finances of President Trump and the Trump Organization. The New York Attorney General's office is also also investigating Trump's ties to Deutsche Bank. Last month, The New York Times reported Deutsche Bank loaned over $2 billion to Trump for real estate deals over nearly two decades, even when other banks refused to do so. Trump still had over $300 million in outstanding loans from Deutsche Bank when he took office as president in 2017. The Justice Department announced Monday the redacted version of special counsel Robert Mueller's report will be released Thursday. Democrats have been calling for the full report, authorizing a subpoena to compel its release. But Attorney General William Barr told lawmakers last week he would not share the unredacted report with the public or members of Congress. Special counsel Mueller handed over the long-anticipated report to the attorney general last month and concluded the Trump campaign did not 
collude with Russia to win the 2016 election, but did not come to a definitive conclusion on possible obstruction of justice. The U.N. is warning the spread of measles is on the rise around the world. The number of cases reported in the first three months of 2019 is three times higher than the same time last year. The highly contagious infection kills 100,000 people every year, mostly children. All regions around the world have been hit by the recent outbreak, with Africa reporting the greatest spike, up 700 percent since last year. The U.N. says the most affected countries are Ukraine, Madagascar, in India. Although the disease is preventable, lack of access to vaccinations in poorer countries has helped contribute to the recent surge in cases. Last week, New York City declared a public health emergency, mandating the vaccination in some parts of Brooklyn, where Orthodox Jewish communities, which have particularly low vaccination rates, have been hit hard by the outbreak. A man accused of setting fire to three historically black churches in Louisiana was charged with hate crimes Monday. Holden Matthews, the 21-year-old son of a deputy sheriff, was also charged with three counts of arson after being arrested last week. The first blaze occurred at the end of last month and the two others in early April. All three churches were in St. Landry Parish, about 30 minutes north of Lafayette. Bernie Sanders released 10 years of tax returns Monday, revealing he's achieved millionaire status since his 2016 presidential bill bid. Senator Sanders responded to a question Monday about whether his income would negatively impact his political message. My view has always been that we need a progressive tax system, which demands that the wealthiest people in this country finally start paying their fair share of taxes. Senator Sanders attributed his increase in wealth to sales from his book, Our Revolution. He told The New York Times last week, I wrote a best-selling book. If you write a best-selling book, you can be a millionaire, too, he said. Other 2020 hopefuls have also released their tax returns, including former Texas Congress member Beto O'Rourke and Senators Kamala Harris, Elizabeth Warren, Amy Klobuchar and Kirsten Gillibrand. President Trump continues to refuse to release his tax returns. Trump has claimed for years he's under audit, a claim disputed by his former personal attorney, Michael Cohen, in congressional testimony earlier this year. In more news about the 2020 elections, former Massachusetts Governor William Weld announced Monday he'll run against Trump for the Republican presidential nomination. Weld's the first Republican to declare a challenge to Trump in 2020. Before becoming governor of Massachusetts, Weld serves as a U.S. attorney appointed by President Reagan. He was the running mate for Libertarian Party candidate Gary Johnson in the 2016 elections. Weld boasts a record of cutting taxes and pushing for spending cuts, but is more centrist views on social and environmental issues, supporting reproductive rights, LBGT issues, and rejoining the Paris Climate Accord. Weld is set to hit the campaign trail today in New Hampshire. The American Medical Association is blasting the Trump administration for banning transgender soldiers from serving in the U.S. military, calling the prohibition medically deficient. The trans ban, which was first announced by President Trump in a July 2017 tweet, formally went into effect Friday. In a statement, the AMA wrote, quote, Sexual orientation and gender identity are not psychological or medical disorders. The estimated 14,700 transgender military personnel are qualified and willing to serve. Rather than stigmatizing and banning these patriots, DOD should let them serve, the AMA said. In Chicago, police arrested seven graduate workers from Loyola University Monday during a protest in front of one of the school's offices. The Loyola student workers and their supporters were protesting the administration's refusal to recognize their union and negotiate a fair contract for their work as teachers and researchers. The graduate workers say their compensation does not provide a living wage, especially considering the soaring cost of tuition, and that they should be treated more as permanent staff and faculty. Members of the union, which is part of SEIU Graduate Workers Forward, are calling for a walkout later this month unless the university agrees to a fair contract. 
The new Secretary of the Interior, David Bernhardt, is being investigated for potential conflicts of interest just four days after the Senate confirmed him to the position. The Interior Department's Inspector General Office said it received multiple complaints against former oil lobbyist Bernhardt when he was Deputy Secretary of the Interior. CNN reported last month Bernhardt made at least 15 policy decisions that directly benefited former clients since joining the agency in 2017. Bernhardt's predecessor, Ryan Zinke, stepped down in December amidst multiple scandals and ethics investigations, two of which are still ongoing. In environmental news, Democratic presidential candidate Senator Elizabeth Warren announced she will ban any new fossil fuel drilling on public lands or waters on day one of her presidency. In a post on Medium, Warren also vowed to increase the production of renewable energy, restore protections to national monuments targeted by the Trump administration, bring in local and tribal leaders to help manage public lands and create thousands of jobs via a youth and veteran conservation corps. Senator Warren wrote, quote, We must not allow corporations to pillage our public lands. America's public lands belong to all of us. We should start acting like it, she said. In climate news, activists across Europe held sit-ins, marches and direct action protests Monday as part of a week-long campaign demanding urgent action on climate change. In London, police arrested over 100 people as protesters shut down Waterloo Bridge and Oxford Circus, with others supergluing themselves to the British headquarters of the Shell Oil Company. This is Theresa Sanders of the direct action group Extinction Rebellion. It's vital. It's the most important thing. Sod Brexit, I'm sorry. And uh, we, I know we've got other things going on now, but if we haven't got a future, what's the point in anything? 16-year-old Swedish activist Greta Thunberg, who's led an international campaign of weekly school strikes for the climate, spoke about the protests from Strasbourg, France, as she prepared to appear at the European Union Parliament. She's due to meet Pope Francis on Wednesday. I feel like the debate is shifting. More people are talk talking about this more and are taking this more seriously and are becoming more aware. But of course, the only thing we, we need to look at is the emission curve, if, if the emissions are actually increasing or if they're reducing. And right now they're increasing. So that is the only thing we should look at. New York City's American Museum of Natural History said Monday it's canceled plans to host Brazil's far-right presidential uh, president, Jair Bolsonaro, at a black tie gala dinner in May. Bolsonaro's planned appearance set off intense protests from environmental and human rights groups, who noted his administration has worked to open Brazil's Amazon rainforest to logging, mining and agribusiness companies, while violating the rights of indigenous people to their ancestral lands. It wasn't the museum that was actually hosting him, it was a group that was renting out the museum's space. But the museum announced they'll go elsewhere. And this year's Pulitzer Prize recipients were announced Monday in New York City. Reporting on gun violence figured prominently, with the South Florida Sun Sentinel winning an award for its coverage of last year's massacre at Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School in Parkland, Florida, and the Pittsburgh Post-Gazette for its breaking news coverage of the mass shooting at the Tree of Life synagogue that killed 11 Jewish worshippers. Reporters from The New York Times and The Wall Street Journal were recognized for their reporting on President Trump. To see our interview with David Barstow of The New York Times on how Trump built his fortune through tax dodging and fraud, go to democracynow.org. Gerald Reuters reporters Wallone and Jaw Sou were also honored for, quote, expertly exposing the military units and Buddhist villagers responsible for the systematic expulsion and murder of Rohingya Muslims from Myanmar, unquote. Reporters Aaron Glantz and Emmanuel Martinez were finalists for their expose of racial discrimination and mortgage lending. You can see our interview with Aaron Glantz at democracynow.org. We will also link to all the winners there. And those are some of the headlines. This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman. And I'm Juan Gonzalez. Welcome to all of our listeners and viewers across the country and around the world. France is in mourning today after a fire ripped through Paris's beloved Notre Dame Cathedral, a medieval church in the heart of the city that was built more than 850 years ago. Thousands of Parisians watched in shock on Monday as the fire toppled the cathedral's spire and continued to burn for hours. 
For centuries, Notre Dame has been the center of Catholic life in France, and it is one of the most visited churches in the world. The fire occurred during the holiest week of the Christian year. Authorities are just beginning to assess how much was damaged inside the church. On Monday night, French President Emmanuel Macron spoke to reporters nearby. Le pire a été évité. The worst has been avoided, even though the battle has not yet been completely won. The next few hours will be difficult, but thanks to the courage of the firefighters, the facade and main towers have not collapsed. So tonight, above all, my thoughts go out to the Catholics, Catholics in France and all over the world, especially during this Holy Week. I know how they feel, and we are with them. My thoughts also go out to all the people of Paris. Notre Dame of Paris is their cathedral and more. The mayor of Paris was with us all these hours, from the first flames, and I know how she and all the residents of the city are feeling. I also want to spare a thought for all our compatriots, because the Notre Dame of Paris is our history, our literature, our imagination, the place where we have lived all our great moments, our epidemics, our wars, our liberation. It is the epicenter of our lives. It is the benchmark from which distances start and from which we measure ourselves from Paris. It appears in so many books, so many paintings. It is a cathedral that is the one of all French men and women, even those who have never come here. Mourners gathered throughout the night in Paris to pray and sing while watching the flames engulf the cathedral, a structure which can be seen throughout the city. destroyed the cathedral spire. Notre Dame's iconic twin medieval towers remain standing, as does the rest of the stone structure. French authorities have launched investigations into how the fire started and the structural stability of the building. The cathedral was undergoing a major restoration when the blaze began. Last year, the Catholic Church launched a major fundraising appeal to help preserve the cathedral. At the time, the Church said parts of the 850-year-old Gothic masterpiece are starting to crumble because of pollution eating the stone, and there are fears the structure could become unstable, they said. French President Macron has vowed to rebuild Notre Dame. Two of France's wealthiest men have already pledged over $330 million. This comes as Macron's government continues to push sweeping austerity measures. Guardian columnist Aditya Chakrabarti tweeted, The Notre Dame exposes the paradoxes of austerity politics. Macron preaches cut for French people, yet swears a national effort to restore a cathedral. Billionaires squeal at paying higher taxes, yet can throw millions at this. We haven't moved far from the rich buying indulgences, he said. The European Union has also vowed to help rebuild Notre Dame. Donald Tusk, the president of the European Council, spoke earlier today in Brussels. The burning of the Notre Dame Cathedral has again made us aware that we are bound by something more important and more profound than treaties. Today we understand better the essence of that which is com common we know how much we can lose and that we want to defend it together. To talk more about the fire at the Notre Dame Cathedral and the Church's historical significance, we're joined now by Anne Lester, associate professor of medieval history at Johns Hopkins University. Professor Lester, welcome to Democracy Now! Describe your feelings as you watched the flame yesterday, the flames engulfing uh, the spire of uh, Notre Dame, uh, the ceiling collapsing, what they called the forest, because it almost took a forest of uh, trees to build that ceiling, the significance of Notre Dame Cathedral. 
Yeah, I mean, I think like everyone across the world watching this, it was shocking and, and devastating, really. Uh, I've spent my career working on Paris, on uh, the medieval period, on Notre Dame, and, and all the things that had been collected in the building there, uh, and the, the life and cultural heritage of this building and, and what it embodies. Uh, I think we were all just shocked watching the, the spire burn and collapse into the center of the cathedral. Uh, and certainly it, it made, I think, everyone think about uh, the way that a monument like this functions in our modern world today. It really is a, a testament uh, to, to a set of ideas, human ideas, in this case, about the divine. And as is true of all monuments, it, it has been here for hundreds of years before us, and we all assumed it would persist for hundreds of years uh, to come. So I think it was, it was a very, it has been a very overwhelming uh, you know, nearly day and a half, day, 24 hours, really. Well, Professor Lester, someone who uh, knows well uh, all of the uh, historical, the, the uh, artifacts and the relics that are uh, in the cathedral, what have you heard uh, so far? What have you been able to glean in terms of what was preserved and what may have been lost? Yeah, what we've learned from, from friends and colleagues uh, in Paris is that it seems very early on there were efforts by the administrators of, of the cathedral and, of course, in coordination with the firefighters to save uh, what they could, that people were, were going in and grabbing what they could and, and leaving the building as quickly as possible. Uh, distinct efforts were made to preserve two of the most important, most holy relics that were contained in the building that would have been the, the center of veneration during Holy Week, uh, first and foremost, of course, the crown of thorns, which is a reliquary dating back to the time of Jesus's passion, uh, the relic of the crown. It was believed that, that that was put on his head at the time of the passion to mark him and to mock him as the king of the Jews during the crucifixion. Uh, it was preserved, then moved over time to Constantinople, and then eventually brought in the middle of the 13th century uh, to Paris, where it resided ever since 1237. Uh, so the history of that relic, the history for the Catholic faith, uh, for uh, the culture uh, of, of France and of Christianity is profound. And it's my understanding that that was saved as well as a relic of the tunic of St. Louis, the king of France in the 13th century, who dies in 1270, a very holy symbol of the, the kingdom of France and the French realm. Uh, and that those two, and possibly other uh, relics and portable objects from the trésor or the treasury were, were saved. I think Lee, what was likely lost from what you have been able to tell so far? Yeah, it's, it's very hard to know. I, I haven't—I mean, another uh, relic of great significance was the relic of the True Cross that was also kept there. I have yet to hear whether that was preserved. Um, certainly what's very clear, even though the, the stonework of the building itself, as well as the vaulting on the interior, for the most part, seems to have been preserved, no doubt, um, deeply scarred. There's going to be both damage from the fire as well as from the water putting the fire out. Uh, water is not good for limestone. Uh, much like marble, it will melt uh, if it uh, is saturated with water and, and not um, able to dry quickly enough. Um, so there, there are parts of the building that were preserved, but then we know much of the wood on the interior, carved wood, part of the choir that would have been carved in wood, that area where the cannons would sit and sing the mass. Uh, it's, it's unclear whether the carved statuary uh, that encircled uh, the high altar and that choir area. Um, a relief sculpture carved beautifully in the later Middle Ages, um, painted in fine detail, something that leapt out to any visitor who walked around that part of the cathedral, because it, it really told in an animated cycle of sculpture um, the story of the life of Jesus. Uh, and it was an extremely compelling way to communicate these stories to people, uh, people 
people from the Middle Ages onward um, who, who didn't read, who couldn't read, or who were listening and knew the stories orally. That seems not to survive. And perhaps most devastating of all uh, is the loss of the glass in the cathedral, because, of course, when a fire burns that hot, the lead that held the stained glass panels in place, particularly in that choir area and in the crossing where the spire fell in the middle of the cathedral, um, that lead would melt and the glass would, would either melt itself because it got so hot um, or, or certainly would be lost. Thankfully, the three, it seems that the three great rose windows on the west, north and south facades um, have, have, have remained in place. And if you can talk about, I mean, the history that the cathedral um, has lived through, if you will. I mean, from the French Revolution, epidemics, the two world wars. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the cathedral, as we see it today, was uh, begun in 1163, if we can imagine that, right? You know, uh, over 800 years ago, and persisted, um, was built over the course of uh, more than 100 years through the 13th century. It changed in styles to express new ideas, new notions of devotion and what the divine was. It changed to accommodate more and more visitors who came to Paris as the city itself grew. And exactly, like, like a monument that is witness to so much that happens around it, um, Notre Dame was there for people during the period of the plague in the 14th century that devastated cities like Paris. Uh, it was there during the period of the Hundred Years' War, a backdrop to uh, the story that played out for someone like Joan of Arc, another hero in French history. Um, likewise, the cathedral persisted through periods of religious war, which marred France. Uh, it, it was there uh, as a symbol and uh, was was damaged in turn on the part of the, the Huguenots uh, active in Paris. It, of course, persisted through the Revolution as well and was a symbol to people in the Revolution, particularly the carving of the kings, representations of the Old Testament kings that were also viewed as representations of the kings of France. They were damaged, the heads lopped off, but the people people of Paris lovingly saved that sculpture, and some of it was able to be restored over time. Notre Dame also persisted through the two board world wars, which is remarkable, as other uh, grand cathedrals in France did not. Chartres, for example, Soissons, Amiens, cathedrals that were damaged, particularly during either the First or Second World War in bombing campaigns. That was not the fate for Notre Dame. The people of Notre Dame actually took down the glass, preserved it, did what they could to preserve the stonework of the cathedral. In this case, with this fire, something so unexpected that moved at such a fast pace, um, there, there was no way there was time to consider how or what could be preserved. So the building itself really has witnessed uh, scores of, of French history, witnessed the very making and remaking of uh, a notion of France and of the French monarchy. Uh, it was a, a crucial building for Napoleon and his I I image and, and vision of, of what France could become uh, in the 19th century, uh, as well as uh, the way that France, you know, restored itself after the Second World War. It became a symbol for people of unity and, and of what it means to rebuild and remake French civilization. And Professor Lester, how do you... Uh, uh your reaction to the, the overwhelming public reaction, people coming forward now to donate, uh, some of the richest people in, in France now, uh, uh, promising hundreds of millions of dollars to restore the, the cathedral, uh, and especially coming as it did, this tragedy right in between uh, Palm Sunday uh, and, uh, and uh, uh, Good Friday and Easter, uh, the holiest week in the, in the, in the Christian calendar. Yeah, I mean, I think the building clearly has resonance far beyond the borders of France. Um, you know, it is it is a world monument. It is marked out that way. Tourists come from across the globe uh, to visit Notre Dame and, and to have walked through the building, uh, to have taken in the kind of vision of, of what the experience of, of the divine should be like. Whether you're a Christian or not, to have entered into that building, you would experience some of that. Uh, and I 
think that the sentiment that we see coming out uh, across the world, and certainly from Americans who've spent a great deal of time there, uh, from people in, in Britain, um, from, from all over who visited, um, this is a monument that has great cultural significance to, to all of us in many ways, representing a whole host of ideas. And to be sure, to Catholics during Holy Week, the loss of this building um, is, is just almost a heart, un, unbelievable, hard to, to really fathom. Uh, I think it's extremely um, difficult for us to conceive of the significance, as I say, of the relics that were kept within the treasury, um, that the crown of thorns would have been processed during Holy Week. It, it would have been the focal point of devotion, as it had been for many years at Notre Dame. Uh, and we're very lucky that the relic itself was saved, but it is hard to imagine the relic having the same meaning, not being able to, to move through the space of the cathedral itself. I think it's not surprising that people are interested in, in donating uh, to, to the restoration of Notre Dame. I think that's crucial. Um, it is clearly a way to bring people together within France. Uh, France, like many countries across the globe, are, are ex just going to experience uh, a set of really difficult decisions, moves for general austerity um, come up against and really point out, uh, again, the sort of paradox of of, of the meaning of a cultural symbol like this, which will demand attention right away. And I hope that there can be ways to, to navigate this situation, um, to have people of means donate as they can, uh, and to really take this as a moment where we can evaluate what it means for all of us to come together as a community and the ways in which cultural symbols, uh, symbols produced uh, for cultural unity, really can function in that way. I think the rebuilding campaign will be tremendously important. Ann Lester, we want to thank you for being with us, Associate Professor of Medieval History at Johns Hopkins University's The Relics They Saved, I understand, will then be on display now at the Louvre while they rebuild the Notre Dame Cathedral. This is Democracy Now! When we come back, Omar Barghouti joins us. The Trump administration did not allow him into the United States, but we break the sound barrier with his voice. Stay with us. People singing Hail Mary across the bridge facing the Notre Dame Cathedral last night as the spire burned. This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman with Juan Gonzalez. We turn now to the ongoing crackdown on pro-Palestinian activism here in the United States. Critics are demanding answers after the Trump administration refused to allow prominent Palestinian human rights activist Omar Barghouti to enter the United States last week, despite his having a valid U.S. visa. Barghouti is co-founder of the Boycott, Divestment and Sanctions Movement, or BDS, an international campaign to pressure Israel to comply with international law and respect Palestinian rights. He was scheduled to be in the U.S. this week to speak at Harvard and NYU and meet with lawmakers in Washington, D.C. But when he arrived at the Ben-Gurion Airport in Tel Aviv on Wednesday, uh, April 10th, Barghouti was told that the United States was denying him entry. He was not given an explanation. 
Omar Barghouti and his supporters say the move was motivated by his involvement with the BDS movement, calling it a form of, quote, McCarthyite repression. This is just the latest attack on the BDS movement in the United States, which has gained steam in recent years. More than 100 measures targeting boycotts and other acts of Palestinian solidarity have been introduced in state and local legislators, legislatures and in Congress since 2014. According to the website Palestine Legal, at least 27 states have now adopted anti-boycott laws, including five executive orders issued by governors. Earlier this year on Capitol Hill, senators passed a bill that included included a controversial anti-BDS provision aimed at preventing opposition to the Israeli government by allowing state and local governments to sanction U.S. companies boycotting Israel. Well, for more, we are turning to Omar Barghouti. He was scheduled to join us here in our Democracy Now! studio in New York today. But instead, he's joining us from Ramallah in the West Bank. Omar Barghouti is the author of Boycott, Divestment, Sanctions, The Global Struggle for Palestinian Rights. Omar, welcome to Democracy Now! Can you describe what happened when you got to the airport in Tel Aviv on Wednesday. Uh, sure. The airline uh, told me there was an issue with my visa, and there wasn't. My visa was valid until 2021. So they called the U.S. consulate in Tel Aviv. And after a long delay, just as I was boarding, they prevented me from boarding, saying that the U.S. consulate had told them that there's an immigration issue, uh, a ban of sorts uh, by the U.S. immigration against me, which was uh, quite unbelievable. I've been to the United States many, many, many times, including on the same visa. And Omar Barghouti, in the past, it's been Israel that has tried to uh, limit your, abil uh, 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 your ability to travel and ban you. How, how were you able to get a, a suspension of the Israeli efforts to stop you from traveling? And were you surprised that this time it was the United States that stepped in? Uh, yes, indeed. Since 2014, Israel has prevented me, or tried quite a few times, uh, uh, prevented me from traveling uh, through de jure and de facto travel bans by refusing to renew my Israeli travel permit, without which I cannot leave and re-enter the country. Uh, this was condemned by Amnesty International, including very recently in February of this year, uh, as an arbitrary measure of punishing me for my human rights uh, activities in the BDS uh, movement. Indeed, this was quite surprising that Israel has outsourced this type of micro-repression of the BDS movement to its allies in the White House. Uh, Israel has, has outsourced quite a lot of its uh, repressive McCarthyite policies to the United States. As your report uh, correctly mentioned, 27 uh, state legislatures have passed clearly unconstitutional, anti-democratic, uh, anti-BDS measures. But this is the first time that we're aware of that this micro-level of repression is, is done by the U.S. Uh, uh, as a proxy for Israel. Mm. Can you respond to your denial uh, by the Trump administration and to the United States? What do you have to say to them? Yes, uh, I think this is just another step that shows uh, how this uh, right-wing administration, uh, which is uh, completely in alliance with Israel's far-right regime, is terrified of our voices, is terrified of, of telling the truth. They're trying to prevent me from meeting U.S. lawmakers in Congress, mainstream media, uh, to speak at a synagogue, to speak at Harvard and NYU, uh, and so on and so forth, and certainly denying me the right to be uh, with my daughter for her wedding, which is happening next uh, Sunday. Uh, so by this, the U.S. administration is just adding to its already very deep record of complicity in Israel's violations of international law, but this time they're violating U.S. law, because this is an ideological and political exclusion. Uh, and ACLU, Penn, U.S., and other organizations are investigating this issue, whether the U.S. State Department is denying me entry over my human rights views. I wanted to ask you, as a, uh, as a founder of the BDS movement, and you've been watching the increased efforts worldwide by the Israeli government to, to squelch and repress the BDS movement, uh, your reaction to the recent reports that ex-Mossad agents uh, have harassed U.S. students and uh, BDS activists here in the United States uh, in, in an effort to uh, intimidate them? 
There are so many ways of, uh, uh, of intimidation that Israel has resorted to, Israel and its lobby groups, whether the traditional Jewish establishment lobby or the Christian Zionist lobby. Uh, they're involved in, in true McCarthyism. I mean, I call it McCarthyism 2.0, an evolved form of the earlier McCarthyism with loyalty to Israel being the litmus test. But Israel is certainly spying on U.S. citizens who are active in the BDS movement, as revealed in Al Jazeera's uh, documentary report, The Lobby, and as Alain Gresh wrote, in Le Monde Diplomatique and Electronic Intifada have revealed Israel is indeed spying and using uh, legal uh, uh, persecution against activists to silence BDS activists. It, uh, several of Israel's lobby groups are funding the so-called Canary Mission, which is smearing activists on campus, especially Jewish activists who support Palestinian rights. And they realize that the number of Jewish activists in the U.S. who support Palestinian rights and even who support BDS is in the, ascend in the ascendance. I wanted to go back to an interview we did last year <clears throat> when we spoke to Bahia Maui, a speech pathologist who's filed a lawsuit against the Pflugerville Independent School District in Texas and the Texas State Attorney General after being forced out of her position for refusing to sign a pro-Israel pledge in her contract. Amawi explained she doesn't consider herself a BDS activist, but does try to avoid purchasing products that support the Israeli occupation. I am not actually an active member of the BDS at all. I'm um, just um, personally for myself, if I'm aware of a product that is, um, you know, supports Israel or is made in, in the country, then I just have a personal, I make a personal choice to avoid it because I don't want to support their ongoing occupation and aggression and then subhuman treatment of the Palestinians. That's making me kind of like a silent participant, complicit with the whole um, occupation. So I actually, I'm not aware of it. I even go through and find out the list of things. I've, I just, um, I just happen to know about it or, um, you know, if somehow I find out, then I just avoid it. But other than that, really, I'm not an active member. So she de she declined to sign her contract. Um, uh, she said, "Quote, um, which would, which said she will not boycott Israel during the term of the contract, and that she would not take any action that's quote intended to penalize, inflict economic harm on, or limit commercial relations with Israel." This was in her contract as a speech pathologist with the company that was working with the schools, and she had been a beloved speech pathologist there for years. Omar Barghouti, how common is this? Uh, this is quite common. Most of the 27 state legislatures that have passed anti-BDS uh, laws or, or uh, signed executive orders by governors uh, look very much the same. They're suppressing the free speech uh, uh, of American citizens. And uh, it's, uh, as ACLU has called it, it's reminiscent of McCarthy-era loyalty oaths. And, and those contracts say that you, you will not engage in a boycott of Israel or of the territories under Israel's control. That is the occupied Palestinian. Palestinian territory or the occupied Syrian uh, territory. Israel and its lobby make no distinction between uh, Israel in the 67, the pre-67 border and the occupied territory of 1967. And indeed, this is uh, raising uh, um, concern among liberals in general, not just supporters of Palestinian rights. Uh, uh, we're seeing that across the United States. People understand very vividly, especially people of color, especially women, LGBTQ groups, and so on, understand vividly that if Israel and its lobby get away with undermining the U.S. Constitution, the First Amendment, by suppressing free speech on Palestine, no one is safe. No one is safe. No one can tell who's next. As the earlier version of McCarthyism has shown us, it wasn't about the communists. It was about all dissenters, all those opposed to, Israel, uh, to U.S. imperialism and intervention and f uh, right-wing uh, politics. Similarly, this McCarthyism 2.0 will not stop at Palestine supporters will not stop at silencing uh, pro-Palestine voices. It will go on to suppress other justice struggles, be it uh, climate justice, gender justice, sexual justice, ethnic, religious justice, and, and racial justice. And Omar Barghouti, I wanted to ask you about the, uh, the latest news about Airbnb. Uh, originally, uh, Airbnb, after 
protests uh, by human rights activists had agreed to remove the listings of thousands of homes of uh, Jewish settlers in the West Bank uh, that uh, had been listed p previously on their site. Uh, but then, uh, just yesterday, they reversed that, and they said they're going to keep those listings on, even though, obviously, these are listings uh, in a territory uh, where there are illegal settlements, uh, according to international law. Your, your reaction to Airbnb apparently uh, uh, caving into pressure. Uh, yes, Airbnb has fallen, has surrendered to Israel's bullying and bullying by Israel's lobby in the United States in a very shameful way, in, indeed. Uh, um, instead of calling Israel's settlements as they are, as the United Nations and almost the entire international community calls them, illegal settlements, illegal colonies in occupied territory that no one should deal with, Airbnb has bowed to Israel's uh, pressure and is, uh, is not going to delist those uh, settlement uh, properties. That's a clear violation of international law, and it will subject Airbnb to possible boycotts by human rights activists around the world. Can you talk about what's happened in Israel in the last week and how it affects you? Um, uh, the election, once again, the record five-term uh, uh, prime minister, Benjamin Netanyahu, despite the fact that uh, the attorney general says he's going to charge him with corruption. What does it mean for where you are in the West Bank and Gaza? Uh, I think Palestinians can expect uh, really troubling times ahead, uh, really darker and a darker era of repression, of violation of our rights, land theft, resource theft, uh, uh, more brutal siege on, on Gaza, more ethnic cleansing in Jerusalem and the Negev uh, and the Jordan Valley. We can expect all that to escalate with uh, fascist forces, openly fascist forces, uh, potentially joining the next Netanyahu government, the so-called Jewish Power Party, which is a Kahanist party that is absolutely fascist and openly calls for ethnic cleansing. At least they're honest. Other uh, more mainstream Israeli parties endorse ethnic cleansing of Palestinians and indeed are doing it piecemeal everywhere, uh, uh, but they're not calling it that. Uh, so at least uh, Israel, with this new government, might lose its final mask, its really worn out thin mask of democracy, as it never was. Since its creation, Israel has always been an apartheid state, and now its claim to democracy, its, its claim to liberalism are completely shattered with this latest election. On the one hand, this will cause more suffering to us, Palestinians everywhere, in the 1967 area, in the 1948 area, in Israel's pre-67 borders, and certainly Palestinian refugees in exile will be even further denied their basic uh, rights. But there's also a silver lining, because Israel's uh, uh, real face as an apartheid colonial regime is being exposed to the whole world, and it's being at the center of the rising far-right white supremacist and fascist tendencies, from Bolsonaro in Brazil to Orban in Hungary to the uh, White House and many in between. So uh, with this, with this exposure, with its loss of any mask, this will further escalate uh, the BDS movement and other solidarity movements to isolate Israel's regime of oppression in all fields, academic, cultural, economic and otherwise. We want to thank you very much for being with us, Omar Barghouti, a Palestinian human rights defender, co-founder of the Boycott, Divestment and Sanctions National Committee, scheduled this week to give talks at NYU, which he did by Skype, interviewed by Peter Beinart last night, Harvard University, and to meet U.S. lawmakers, Trump administration barring him from entering the United States, which also means he cannot come to his daughter's wedding. Omar Barghouti is author of Boycott, Divestment, Sanctions, The Global Struggle for Palestine. Palestinian rights. This is Democracy Now! When we come back, the attack on freshman Congress member Ilhan Omar, as she says there's a spike in death threats against her, as the Trump administration, and particularly President Trump himself, attacks her. Stay with us.
Dance of the Bird by Hossam Hayek. This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman with Juan Gonzalez. Well, Minnesota freshman Congress member Ilhan Omar says death threats against her have spiked in numbers since President Trump tweeted a video juxtaposing her image with footage of the 9-11 attacks. Trump posted the 43-second video Friday with the caption, We will never forget. The president's tweet intercut video of the World Trade Center towers burning with video of Omar speaking about the increasing attacks on the Muslim American community after 9-11. Uh, Omar was speaking at a Council on American-Islamic Relations event last month. Far too long, we have lived with the discomfort of being a second-class citizen. And frankly, I'm tired of it, and every single Muslim in this country should be tired of it. <laughs> CARE was founded after 9-11 because they recognized that some people did something and that all of us were starting to lose access to our civil liberties. In fact, founded in 1994, Omar's spokesperson later said she misspoke and, quote, meant to refer to the fact that the organization had doubled in size after the September 11th attacks, end of quote. Congress member Omar's comments were originally taken out of context and circulated by right-wing media, from The Daily Caller to Fox News. In a statement, Congress member Omar said, quote, since the president's tweet Friday evening, I have experienced an increase in direct threats on my life, many directly referencing or replying to the president's video. This is endangering lives. It has to stop. The hashtag Stand with Ilhan trended as conservative voices continued to attack Congressmember Omar over the weekend. Trump said on Twitter Monday he's heading to Minnesota. Omar tweeted, the great state of Minnesota where we don't only welcome immigrants, we send them to Washington. Hashtag no ban act. In New York City, Yemeni bodega owners responded to the attacks against Congressmember Omar by announcing they're boycotting the sale and purchase of the New York Post over its front page attack on Omar. The Murdoch owned daily paper featured an image of the burning Twin Towers on 9 11 referencing Omar's comment out of context, 9-11 was some people did something, and the words, here's your something, in large print over the photo. The Yemeni American Merchants Association said the cover provoked hatred and targeted people of the Muslim faith. To talk more about Congressmember Ilhan Omar, we're joined by Mustafa Bayoumi, the author of This Muslim American Life, Dispatches from the War on Terror. His recent Guardian piece headlined, Ilhan Omar has become the target of a dangerous hate campaign. Uh, Mustafa Bayoumi is an English professor at Brooklyn College and the City University of New York, also author of How Does It Feel to Be a Problem, Being Young and Arab in America. Welcome back to Democracy Now! It's great to have you with us. Um, <clears throat> talk about what others have said over time, this is the argument you make in your piece, Ilman, Ilhan Omar has become the target of a dangerous hate campaign. Give us a few quotes. <laughs> sure. Well, I mean, if you think, if you just have even a short-term memory, I think you can remember that um, George W. Bush, the former president of the United States, said something to the effect of, when referring to the 9-11 attackers, said something to the effect of, well, these folks uh, committed this act. Wait, actually, we've got that clip. Sources of the federal government uh, go to help the victims and their families and, the, and to conduct a full-scale investigation to hunt down and to find those folks who committed this act. To find the folks who committed this act. Yeah, so that, in, to my ear, that sounds quite similar to what Ilhan Omar said. And, and in fact, George Bush is saying it to the whole country. Um, and he's uh, not uh, uh, considered to be anti-American for that statement whatsoever. So, I, in fact, I think what Ilhan Omar is saying is p completely within the, you know, the boundaries of what is normal political discourse in this country. And we could go on. That, that's one example. Um, another example would be, um, you know, Ilhan Omar is now accused for, uh, of claiming that uh, her detractors will say that she claims that Jewish people in the United States um, suffer from a dual loyalty campaign. 
Well, in fact, actually, she did not say that. So I think it's important to qualify what she did say and what she did not say. She asked, she talked about questions of allegiance. And if we listen to your last segment and we talk about anti-BDS laws, in fact, those are, in fact, allegiance laws that are built into now the very system of the United States. However, somebody did say something that was, uh, in fact, claiming dual loyalty for Jewish Americans, and that would be our president now, Donald Trump. Explain what he said. He said something to the effect of, when speaking to a, a Jewish American group, he said something the about— The Jewish Republican coalition in Las Vegas. In fact, week. that's right. And he said, well, um, uh, let me talk about your prime minister. So he referred to Benjamin Netanyahu as their prime minister. Uh, how, how do you how do you account for this e enormous uh, 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 campaign that has been launched against this freshman Congress member in terms of uh, by so many conservatives and right wing groups uh, in the country and by the president himself? Uh, what um, in your sense, what's behind it? Well, on one level, it's very clear. Ilhan Omar is one of two uh, Muslim women elected to Congress, the first two Muslim women elected to Congress. That gives her, I think, a certain level of prominence, along with a certain level of vulnerability. Not only that, but, of course, being, you know, openly Muslim, she wears hijab, um, uh, she covers her hair, uh, she's a, a refugee, she's an immigrant, she's a black woman. Um, so she occupies all of those vulnerable positions in our society today. But it's not only that, I believe, if you ask me, because mm -hmm. if she were a quiet black refugee woman from Somalia, Muslim, who covered her hair and all of that stuff, then I think people would love to trot her out for the, for the optics alone. But she's not a quiet congresswoman. In fact, I think that's a great thing. In fact, she seems to be a highly principled and highly effective politician, even just in the short time that she's been in Congress. So I think that, in fact, she's a scary figure to a lot of people who are on the right, and even sometimes to the mainstream establishment of the Democratic Party as well. That's what, that was going to be my follow-up. Well, what about the reaction of the establishment of the Democratic Party to the threats against her and to the scapegoating of her? Yes. Well, you know, I think that what we saw was, in fact, some, in some ways, a, a litmus test of where the Democratic leadership and also those vying for the presidency lie on one of the more important issues of our day, which is, you know, is Islamophobia, fundamentally. Um, what we saw with uh, Nancy Pelosi's uh, uh, statement, for example, on Ilhan Omar was, I thought, extremely disappointing. I thought she was um, uh, refusing to name Ilhan Omar uh, explicitly was not uh, didn't come out to, in her defense and in fact was backhandedly accusing her of, uh, of, of, of sacralizing or desacralizing I should say 9/11 you know uh, territory which was not the point of, of the uh, of this controversy at all so I, I thought that Nancy Pelosi's response was in fact quite shameful and now uh, she's being attacked for criticizing Stephen Miller for his fierce anti-immigrant views, um, being told that she, because she's talking about Stephen Miller in the administration, she is singling out a Jewish member of the administration, which proves she is anti-Semitic. We had on uh, Dr. David Glosser, who is Stephen Miller's uncle, mm -hmm. his sister's son, who criticized his nephew for his extremist anti-immigrant views. Yeah, exactly. I mean, does that mean that Ilhan Omar can only criticize Ilhan Omar? That, was, that would be the natural result of that. She's not criticizing Stephen Miller for his Jewishness. She's criticizing Stephen Miller for the positions that he holds, and that's completely within the boundaries of American political discourse. So what does this mean for Muslims around the country? Uh, Ilhan Omar says she herself has faced this spike in death threats against her. Um, President Trump pinning the tweet of the video where he's juxtaposed the 9-11 attacks with Ilhan Omar? We know about the attacks on the Tree of Life synagogue, the 11 Jewish worshipers that were killed, with a killer citing the same words that President Trump used, invaders, invasion. Um, President Trump's words and what he tweets has meaning. Absolutely. Um, in fact, there was a study that was performed last year, that was published last year, that said that there's a direct correlation with um, Donald Trump's anti-Muslim tweets and the rise in anti-Muslim hate crimes. 
Uh, so, uh, Twitter and hate crimes, unfortunately, are connected. And they're not only connected in the United States, they're connected internationally as well. That's what the study found. And in fact, not only is what Donald Trump tweeted completely disturbing, um, but it's also coming within weeks of 50 people being killed in New Zealand in two different mosques by a man who also connected, was, felt himself connected to Donald Trump and his ideology. And let's not forget what uh, the New Zealand Prime Minister Jacinda Ardern responded to President Trump when he asked what can he do when he called the prime minister, and she said, respect the Muslim community, as she then put on hijab herself to comfort the families of those killed. We want to thank you, Mustafa Bayoumi, for being with us, author of This Muslim American Life, Dispatches from the War on Terror, professor at Brooklyn College. Uh, we'll link to your piece in The Guardian. This is Democracy Now! I am Amy Goodman with Juan Gonzalez. We have job openings at democracynow.org, and you can sign up for our newsletter there as well. Thanks so much.